Come on, y'all. Put our voices together and worship God. Yeah. and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a pleasure to be with you today as we do something truly special, as we come together from our homes, our communities, even across our churches and districts to worship the one who gives us life and hope. The North Georgia Conference of the United Methodist Church is home to so many faithful disciples, talented lay people, and dedicated clergy. As we worship today, you will get to experience a small portion of the love and passion that is poured out in worship throughout our conference every week. I pray that this will be a time of reverence or renewal for each of you who join us today, a time when we might turn our hearts to God in prayer and praise as one body bound together in love. Join me in the call to worship. Called by the Spirit, we gather to praise our Maker and our Redeemer. We are the body of Christ and part of each other. Called by the Spirit, we gather to remember God's faithfulness and pray hopefully for our future. 
We are the body of Christ and part of each other. Called by the Spirit we gather to lament and to celebrate. To repent and to reconcile. We are, we are the body of Christ and part of each other. Let us worship the God who makes us one. this moment of deep hurt and deep uncertainty for our world, we know that there is much for which we must pray. We also know that the petitions of our hearts take many forms. Today our prayer will be guided musically by this offering from two of our conference's worship leaders, Atticus Hicks and Tavares Stevens. As we enter into a time of opening our hearts and ourselves to God, I encourage you to call to mind the people and situations that you are holding in prayer. Listen to the music, listen to the words, and lift up the joys, hopes, and concerns that you carry. You may choose to write those prayers out, to speak them aloud, or to hold them silently. However you pray, I hope you will join me in this moment of meditation before God.
our mother's wails reach the throne of heaven quiet storms form in hearts now unleavened false balances of sin falter in the wind holy embers ignite as the spirit enters in justice won't be silent mercy reigns over violence compassion defeats the sword in the presence of the lord embattled souls reclaimed there's a breaking of the chains of the way the truth the life sets every heart and soul ablaze in that fire in our bones is the ancient of days proclaiming freedoms here and now salvation came to save so spirit breathe and enter in new worlds can begin as an all-consuming fire and a mighty rushing wind the spirit breathe and enter in new worlds do begin as an all-consuming fire and a mighty rushing wind the spirit breathe into in new worlds begin as an all-consuming fire and a mighty rushing wind oh, yes. join me in speaking aloud these words of prayer. Spirit, breathe and enter in to every heart, to every community, to every place where your people call out for you. Let your presence among us ignite our passion to serve you with humility and justice. Bind us together as one church, reconciled through your holy grace. And kindle the embers of hope within us that we might share your light with a weary world in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 26. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. 
to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, all these activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong in the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chooses. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable be clothed with greatest honor. And our less respectable members are treated with great respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension with the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If, if one, one member suffers, suffers all, all suffer together, together with it. it. If, if one, one member is honored, all rejoice together, together with, with it. it. Several years ago, walking became a part of my exercise routine. It was not uncommon for me to walk six or seven miles. And while walking was good for my health, walking was also a time for reflection, for prayer for breathing fresh air and for allowing God's creation to minister to me. But while I enjoyed the benefits of walking, after a while I noticed that my back started hurting. No matter how much I stretched before I exercised, at some point along the way it became less comfortable for me to walk. And so after doing some research, I made an appointment to see a chiropractor. On the day of my appointment, I arrived at the office, signed in, and was then escorted to a room adjacent to the reception area where I was offered a seat and told that the doctor would be with me shortly. And after a few minutes passed, the doctor came in, introduced herself, and asked me to tell her what was going on. After I shared with her the reason why I had made the appointment, she explained to me the chiropractic approach to health. She talked to me about the spine and its purpose and how it functioned, how it was cr critical to protect the spinal cord and the internal organs and how it provided structure and balance for the body and even the role it played in enabling flexibility. She then informed me that she would like to begin my examination. She had me to stand and then she took some measurements and then she had me to lie down and took further measurements. She showed me the math and indicated that one of my legs was several inches shorter than the other. But then she told me that they were going to take an x-ray of my spine. After the x-ray was taken, the doctor returned. She placed the film on an imaging device and then proceeded to point out what I could now clearly see with my own eyes, that my spine was out of alignment. But not only was it out of alignment, but it had actually began to curve like it was beginning to form the letter S. She then went on to explain the many ways in which our spines can become misaligned. But then she said something that struck me. She said that when our spines are out of alignment, that over a period of time, our musculoskeletal system begins to adjust and adapt to the misalignment. In other words, not only was my spine out of alignment, but my muscles had adjusted and adapted themselves to the misalignment. It was why one of my legs was longer than the other, and the principal reason why I had begun to experience discomfort in my back after walking for a period of time. 
But after informing me that one of my legs was longer than the other, and after showing me that my spine was out of alignment and telling me that my muscles had adjusted and adapted themselves to the misalignment, after telling me what I considered to be the bad news, she then told me that she had some good news. She told me that while she could not guarantee that my spine would become perfectly straight again, she told me that it would become much straighter than it was. But then she said that if it was going to become straighter, then it would take some time and it would take me being willing to undergo a series of adjustments. That is, I would have to come in on a regular basis. She then went on to explain that if I was willing to invest the time and subject myself to a series of routine adjustments, not only would my spine become straighter, but my muscles would readjust themselves to the new alignment. And I believe that the experience that I had with my chiropractor may provide some insight and be instructive for those that the Apostle Paul refers to as the body of Christ, specifically the body of believers who were at the church called Corinth. Now Corinth was a church that had some issues. And so they reached out to the Apostle Paul. They wrote him a letter and 1 Corinthians is Paul's response to their letter. And in this response, he addresses the concerns that they have. He talks about the divisions that they were experiencing and a host of other issues. But the gift that the Apostle Paul gives to us in this text is that he reminds the believers that they, the issues that they were facing were largely symptomatic of something deeper. In other words, one way of looking at Paul's response to the church at Corinth is that the first 11 chapters of Paul's letter is equivalent of an x-ray that Paul has taken of the church. And according to the results, he found that the spine of the Corinthian church was out of alignment. He acknowledged that while the divisions within the church were real, they were symptomatic of something much deeper. While the lack of accountability and the willingness to turn a blind eye to the behavior that was clearly inappropriate was real, it was symptomatic of a deeper issue. While the abuses at the Lord's Supper were a problem, they too were symptomatic of a deeper issue. A deeper issue that I believe he describes well in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, where he says, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? In other words, what the Apostle Paul is suggesting is that the results of the x-ray have revealed some telling things about the church at Corinth. It has revealed that the spine of the Corinthian church is out of alignment. Indeed, the spine of the church is crooked. It is the kind of alignment that occurs when the Holy Spirit is no longer at the center of the church's work and Jesus is no longer central to the church's worship. It is the kind of alignment that occurs when, when divine inspiration has been supplanted by what the Apostle Paul refers to as human inclination. And I would remind us that just as the musculoskeletal system adjust and adapts to the spine when it is out of place or out of alignment in the human body. So the systems of a church begin to adjust themselves to the misalignment of the church's spine. Paul describes one of the ways this misalignment rooted in human inclinations manifests itself when he says, for when one says, I belong to Paul, and another says, I belong to Apollos, are they not merely human? In other words, according to Paul, one of the things that lies at the heart of human inclination are allegiances and alliances that are rooted in competition, in power, and in control. And this begs the question for the North Georgia Conference and for the United Church at this time in our history. Are the divisions and fighting and battles and potential split that stands on the horizon symptomatic of something much deeper within the life of our church? 
are our alliances with the left, with the right, with the center, with the center left and center right, indicative of or symptomatic of something much deeper going on within the life of the United Methodist Church. Could it be if we took the time to examine ourselves, what might be revealed is the same thing that the Apostle Paul discovered was plaguing the church at Corinth, that their symptoms were the result of infantile behavior steeped in a church culture that caters to human inclinations rooted in competition. Competition where we align ourselves, measure ourselves, and determine worth and value based on size and, and on numbers and on money. Indeed, might it be that the difficulties of our church, that our church are facing at this time in history, be the result of the church's spine being out of alignment? Could it be that the musculoskeletal system of the church, our ministries, our agencies, and the host of other components of our church have adjusted and adapted themselves to this misalignment? To be sure, a person can still walk with a crooked spine. A person can still run with a crooked spine. We just won't be walking and running the way that God intended for us to walk and run. We'll still be able to move, but we won't be able to do all that God wants us to do for Christ. Indeed, this is one of the reasons why I'm grateful for Paul's instruction in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. In fact, I believe that chapter 12 provides a course of action to get the spine of the church at Corinth back in proper alignment. Paul is providing for them a series of adjustments that will straighten out the church's spine. And when the spine of the church is straight, the internal workings of the church will work better. The church will walk more upright and the church will also possess the flexibility and nimbleness necessary to adapt and to make changes. And I want to suggest at least three things that the Apostle Paul offers as part of a series of adjustments for the church at Corinth and for us. The first is what Paul says in verse seven, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. One of the stories I love to tell is a story about a missionary who traveled quite extensively throughout the continent of Africa. And on one occasion during his travels, he found himself in a small village. And on this particular day, he was in the company of the children of this village who were sitting together and playing. And so he decided that he would introduce something different into their play. There was a tree that was standing some distance away. And he said to the children that he would give a piece of candy to the first child to arrive at that tree. And it was then that he witnessed something that he had not only not anticipated, but something for which he was not prepared. One child grabbed the hand of another child, and that child proceeded to grab the hand of another child, who then grabbed the hand of another child, who grabbed the hand of another child, and so on and so on, until all of the children were holding hands. And then, and only then, did they take off running in unison, and all of them arrived at the tree at exactly the same time. In essence, what this missionary had done was he attempted to introduce into the play life of those children a way of being where priority was given to competition. That is to say, whoever reached the tree first was the winner and the winner would be rewarded. In his mind, there could only be one winner and the reward was based upon one person winning. But what he encountered was a group of African children whose upbringing and orientation towards the world was not rooted in competition. Rather, these African children's orientation towards life was rooted in what the Apostle Paul refers to in the 12th chapter of our text as the common good. It is an orientation towards living where a premium was placed on community and cooperation and each person was deemed to be of inestimable worth. It was an orientation towards life where competition was recognized and valued, but not at 
the expense of or to the detriment of the commonwealth or the well-being of the entire community. And I want to suggest to us that it may be a failure to properly grapple with this sense of the common good that might lie at the heart of our nation's inability to address our current struggles. For what protesters are saying is that the spine of this nation has been out of alignment for a very long time. And while this nation's institutions and systems have adapted to our nation's spine being out of alignment and that while many have suffered because this nation's spine remains out of alignment, there is a desire for this nation to be healthy so that it can work well for every citizen in this country. Indeed, adherence to the common good is an essential tenet of our nation that takes its health seriously, as well as a church that desires to be an effective witness for Christ. It is the common good, not what the Apostle Paul refers to as the human inclinations of people bent on remaining on a diet of infant milk all their lives and that create divisions and alliances rooted in competition that must be a part of the adjustment the church is willing to undertake for effect of witnessing in this world. But in addition to the common good being an essential element in correcting the church's alignment, Paul speaks to what I call the bandwidth of a church that is seeking to be properly aligned. He describes it as a church that has one body, but many members. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying to the community of believers at Corinth that those who gather in the name of Christ and under the power of the Holy Spirit possess the gravitas to embrace the variety of gifts given to the church by God and the variety of people who have been called by God to serve God's church. Where there is no bandwidth to embrace these variety of gifts and people that God has given to this church, then it is indicative of a church's willingness to operate with a spine that is out of alignment. The church will still be able to function, but the church's witness will be diminished. But in addition to the common good and the church practicing increased bandwidth, the third thing that is a component of Paul's series of adjustments for the Corinthian church is the church's capacity to value the people the way God values them. And by valuing them, the Apostle Paul means that the church operates from a position that our well-being is inextricably bound together with the well-being of others. That we share in each other's joys as well as each other's sorrows. And then finally, Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit must be central to the work of God's church. The late Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor tells the story of a man who owned a compass. And he said that whenever that man opened that compass, the arrow of the compass was pointing to the north. One day, someone broke into this man's home and stole some of his jewelry. And among the items taken was that compass. And when that thief opened the compass, the arrow of the compass was pointing to the north. One day the thief sold the compass to a fisherman and when that fisherman opened the compass, the arrow of the compass was pointing to the north. One day while out fishing, the fisherman accidentally dropped the compass overboard and, and then one day a diver came along and found it. And when the diver opened the compass, it was still pointing to the north. And Dr. Proctor said that the reason that the arrow of the compass was always pointing to the north is because there was a metal on the inside of that compass called a lodestone that always caused the arrow to point to magnetic north. The conventional wisdom was that if you know where north is, you should be able to determine which direction you need to go in. Well, the Holy Spirit is the lodestone for the church of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is who keeps the church pointed in the right direction. The Holy Spirit grounds the church of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one that keeps the church true to the church's mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ. 
the Holy Spirit equips and, and empowers the church for service and for effective witness in this world. The Holy Spirit gives the power and the courage and the desire to be in right communion with God's people, both Christian and non-Christian. Indeed, when the Holy Spirit is present, then perhaps instead of talking about what tribe we belong to, we will lend our voices to the echo of the prophet Isaiah, a voice that cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be made low and the uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all God's people will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen and amen. As we prepare to receive God's grace through the sharing of Holy Communion, we remember that this is not only a moment for receiving, but also for giving. In fact, the word Eucharist means thanksgiving. This is a time for giving thanks for God's gift of salvation and giving of ourselves, both through our participation in the sacrament and through our tithes and offerings. So friends, I encourage you to give generously, first and foremost to your local congregations. We know that our local churches are the places that shape us and build us up, that nurture us and send us out to serve. So I hope that you'll consider giving to your church today. If you are not part of a local congregation or wish to give above and beyond, I hope that you will consider supporting one of the larger ministries of the United Methodist Church. Locally, you might choose to give to Action Ministries, a United Methodist affiliated nonprofit here in North Georgia that is dedicated to addressing the challenges of poverty by focusing on hunger relief, housing, and education. Globally, I encourage you to consider supporting the work of the United Methodist General Commission on Religion and Race, which works to challenge and equip leaders in the United Methodist Church and beyond in the work of dismantling racial discrimination in all its forms. However you choose to give, your offerings are a response to God's grace a grace that is poured out on each of us as we approach Christ's table. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This is the sound of one voice. One spirit, one voice. The sound of one who makes a choice. This is the sound of one voice. This is the sound of one voice. This is the sound of voices too. The sound of me singing with you. Helping each other to make it through this is the sound of voices too this is the sound of voices too this is the sound of
As you go forth today, I encourage you to continue praying for the church, for your pastors, for your friends and neighbors. In the coming days, people all over the North Georgia Conference will participate in a 24-hour prayer vigil from June 30th to July 1st. This time of prayer will center us in the covenant of our baptism and unite us in care for our clergy and congregations as they begin a new year of ministry together. I hope that you will be a part of praying for our church on your own or as part of that vigil. Now, friends, go with this blessing.
y'all. Put our voices together and worship God. Yeah. Christian 